Years and years ago, when I first heard that Ubuntu was going to make the leap from your standard computer hardware to smartphones, I was excited. At the time, I was just making the switch from Android to iOS, and the thought of having a true open-source Linux alternative in the smartphone space was absolutely appealing. This was also about the same time that Firefox was announcing they were going to release a mobile OS, and Windows Mobile and BlackBerry OS seemed like they might still have a chance of clawing back some market share. It was, well, a different time. Here in 2021, I'm a little bit more wise. Or jaded. Remarkable how often proponents of one will claim the other. But no, instead of a world of diversity and options, we wound up with a smartphone market that's functionally identical to this PC market. One option basically everyone uses because it's available on devices across a broad spectrum of prices, and one option made by Apple. Because, uh, Apple. It's not that I have inherent problems with Android or Apple devices. I'm quite happy with my iPhone. It's an extremely useful tool, and it does what I want without any fuss. But dag nab it if I wouldn't like to have a few more options. Of course, there are other options, in both computing and mobile spaces, technically. Options that give you access to the features and software functionality that takes years to show up in the popular consumer space. And so here we are to talk about a $200 phone that is designed to run Linux. Now I talked a bit about the hardware while doing my unboxing, but as a quick summary, the phone's body is made out of plastic, but the construction is solid. It's very dense and feels pretty good in the hand, assuming you have big hands. Because this is not a small phone. It's not exactly enormous, but you're not getting anything compact here. The buttons feel pretty good and the back comes off, so you can easily replace the battery or access the micro SD card or SIM tray which accepts mini SIMs. Which is less than ideal, but at least they included a micro to mini adapter in the box. If we turn this on, we can start to get a sense for how it is to use. The screen isn't an incredible resolution, especially at very nearly 6 inches, but at 720 by 1440 pixels, it's sharp enough for everyday use, and the bezels aren't outlandishly huge, even if it's not in vogue to have a forehead and chin in this day and age. In terms of other salient specs, we have an all-winner A64, a 64-bit quad-core SoC built around the ARM Cortex A53 cores, and a Mali 400 MP2 GPU. Since this is the community edition of the phone, it has 3 gigs of RAM instead of the standard 2 available on the $150 phone, and yes, there is a version of this device available for $150. Bucks. Kind of makes you wonder what exactly you've been paying Samsung for all these years, especially since their latest $700 phone also has a plastic back. But actually, let's talk about that, because as it happens, you're paying Samsung for quite a bit, like a significantly more powerful SoC and three times the RAM, and also software development, and quality assurance testing, and so forth. Because the fact of the matter is, in terms of usability, the Pine phone feels like a fifth as much phone as most $700 flagships, and quite frankly, that's to be expected given the price. Pine64 themselves don't really claim that this is a mass-market Linux phone. What they're really trying to accomplish here is providing a platform that Linux developers can use as a sort of ruler as they work to create software that could eventually result in a mass-market Linux phone. They're trying to basically create a market from scratch with this device, and that's quite the ask when you come right down to it. But I'm not a Linux dev, I'm a tech enthusiast, so let's look at this from more of a consumer standpoint. It's a really solid size, with an adequate screen, and what has come to be a party trick in 2021, a removable battery. Not a bad start for a budget smartphone, even if there's a non-zero percent chance that you'll get a display with dead or stuck pixels. This is apparently a common enough problem that Pine64 calls it out specifically on their store page, and say that if you're the type of person that would bug, don't buy the phone. And I've got one, actually. See there? That green dot's name is Little Green. Thankfully, the version of the phone I've got shipped with Manjaro, so the whole system theme is green, and in use, it's actually pretty easy to forget Little Green is there. Of course, there are a few other party tricks in here beyond the replaceable battery. The community edition of the phone ships with a USB-C dock that you can use to hook up a monitor, keyboard, and mouse, and even a gigabit Ethernet connection, turning this little phone into a full desktop Linux machine. And while there's still work to be done on the software side to clean up this interface, depending on what operating system you're running, it's actually pretty useful. And oh yes, you can swap operating systems at will. The micro SD card slot above the battery is actually bootable, and the phone preferences that first in the boot order. That means you can completely alter the experience of using your device by simply downloading one of the free Linux distros that are available for the platform via links helpfully provided on the PinePhone forums and loading it onto an SD card. There are also projects that allow you to make a multi-boot image, with currently 17 different flavors of OS to choose from on a single card. Cool, right? There are a lot of little details like that which make the Pine phone really interesting to me, and I would venture to say any tech enthusiast or Linux guru out there. The device is as open as the platform it's designed for, giving you the ability to use it in whatever format you want, be it a phone or a desktop, 
with whatever operating system you want, be it Ubuntu or Debian, or even, heck, open source ports of Android. And all that capability starts at just $150. So would I recommend this phone to the average consumer? Absolutely not. I've been excitedly waiting on the sidelines of the Linux world for nearly 20 years at this point, looking for the platform to become mainstream. And we're only just now getting to the point where I can gesture broadly at a Linux distro and say, yeah, based on what you're trying to do, that thing is a great fit for an average consumer machine. Mobile Linux distros are so much further behind in terms of that development, and experience suggests we've got at least another decade to go before the community produces something that feels like a commercial operating system. And my experience backs that up, at least where the Pinephone is concerned. I've tried about 10 different distros on this device so far, and while I will give props to Ubuntu Mobile and Selfish OS for providing a genuinely interesting new way of interacting with a smartphone, it was actually Mobian, the straight mobile port of Debian, that gave me the most well-rounded and reliable experience. Everything else had at least one hardware driver that wasn't functioning, and some of them are in such a state of incompleteness that it's sort of a miracle they even managed to initialize the touchscreen. But even with Mobian enabling all of the hardware correctly, the hardware itself is still very lackluster. The SoC just can't reasonably keep up with general use, meaning that animations are extremely choppy and the device feels very sluggish to respond. The speakers and microphones are barely adequate, and the cameras can only be conservatively referred to as cameras. Charitably speaking, the hardware is crap, and while you may be wondering how exactly that description is charitable, I'll point you to the complete lack of expletives. But, here's the thing. For the target market, enthusiasts and developers who are actually trying to start a market, that's all totally fine. The hardware doesn't need to be good, it just needs to be present so they can work on integrating their software and use cases into a fully formed device. Now you may suspect that this represents a pretty flipping tiny market, and you're not necessarily wrong. But also consider that these are open source devices. Absolutely anybody with any interest can be a developer in these communities with some effort, education, and access to relevant hardware, like the Pinephone. And there's also another market we haven't talked about, consumers that are very concerned about the privacy of their mobile devices. While this may not have been the exact purpose behind the creation of the Pinephone, privacy, security, and control over your digital footprint is inherent in the base design methodology of most open source apps and the Linux kernel itself. And the Pinephone includes some pretty incredible privacy features, such as the ability to physically disable the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cellular modems, as well as the cameras, microphone, speakers, and headphone jack via these little switches inside the back cover. This is in addition to the security you get by using the only OS platform in the mobile space that doesn't require you to sign up for an account with one tech giant or another in order to download and install apps. This kind of emphasis on giving you mobile capability without any effort or even desire to track and monetize your use of those capabilities is absolutely one of a kind. And that's speaking as an iPhone user. Sure. Apple may well be the lesser of the various other evils where privacy is concerned, but a lesser evil is still, well, evil. Nobody was willing to let Mephisto off the hook just because he wasn't Diablo. And yes, that was a Diablo 2 reference. Thanks for noticing. Because the simple truth is that if you're worried about the government installing a tracking chip in your shoulder via a vaccine, for example, and assuming we're going to set aside the laws of physics that would suggest that's literally impossible, you really need to reevaluate the fact that you're posting that on social media along with a selfie taken on a phone that had location metadata enabled by default via a data connection to a cellular tower. The government didn't need to chip us, we chipped ourselves in order to enjoy the convenience of a digitally connected life. So the conclusion then. The Pine Phone is not the Linux phone for the masses, and it never claimed to be. But if you're a Linux guru, or even just an enthusiast, who wants in on the relatively speaking early days of mobile Linux, then it does represent a great value for the hardware you get and the unique open features it offers. Also, if you take your privacy seriously but you still want or need to have some sort of doorway into the digitally connected life everyone is becoming increasingly immersed in, the Pine Phone also represents some of the best value you can get on that doorway, while still allowing you to retain some control. No, that's not a huge audience. But that doesn't mean the phone is bad, just narrowly scoped. And that's probably good, considering I don't think Pine64 has the manufacturing partnerships in place to suddenly become the next Apple or Samsung. But hey, the entire BlackBerry user base could migrate over here anytime they wanted to. I'm sure they've got a half dozen devices to get y'all covered. <laughs>